Welcome back to the Anti-Social Studies Podcast, a place for people who wish they'd stayed awake in high school. Last time, we explored the early modern era. Europe had clearly risen out of the medieval era and was looking to explore and influence other parts of the world, and the rest of the world was forced to react to this new power out of the West. Some places, like Africa, got dragged into the new global economy to benefit Europe. Others tried to keep doing things the way they always had, with less success over time, like the Ottomans and the Chinese, and a few newer, younger powers showed more flexibility and adapted to Western ways in Russia and Japan. A quick plea, if you are listening to this and you like what I'm doing, will you please head over to iTunes and give me a rating and review? iTunes is quite murky with their algorithms, but I would love for more people to be able to find my podcast, and from what I can tell, they promote new shows based on ratings, so give me those stars if you like what I'm doing. Thanks. Okay, enough business, let's get to history. Today, we're going back to the modern era in the West, or as I like to call it, you say you want a revolution. It's from 1750 to 1900, and we'll look at political revolutions and talk about why George Washington was the best. We'll also see the dominance of Britain as the leader of the new industrial revolution and the age of imperialism. Look out, world. The sun's about to never set on you. Ah, what? I don't know. That didn't make sense. This is Anti-Social Studies. I'm Emily Glankler. Settle in and let's go back in time. Act 1. Anatomy of a Revolution. Remember all those Enlightenment ideas from last era in Europe? People like John Locke were like, you should be able to change your government if it's not serving the people. And other people were like, yeah, we have rights. How good am I at reviewing stuff, by the way? So those ideas get put into action in the modern era. And it's really cool because most revolutions throughout history follow a pretty similar path. Historian Crane Britton coined the term anatomy of a revolution, and it basically goes like this. People grow more frustrated with an old regime until there is eventually violence or a forceful overthrow. A new, more moderate government gets established that institutes some change, But people within the government disagree over what this new government should look like, and often this disagreement splits between moderates and radicals. Chaos ensues until a new power, sometimes a strong man, step in and reassert control. The other way I like to think about revolutions is through triangles. I draw so many triangles on my whiteboard when I talk about this era that it looks like a geometry class in there, but it's fun. Basically, if you envision society as a triangle, the elites at the top the upper middle class right below them, and then everyone else at the bottom. For the sake of simplicity, we'll call the elites the ones, the upper middle class the twos, and everyone else the threes. The everyone else, or threes, section of this triangle is way bigger than any other group. What pretty much always happens in a revolution is that the ones control everything, which makes the other groups mad. The twos, who are typically educated and have some access to the power structure, go down to the threes and get them all riled up. This sucks. How dare the ones tell us what to do? The threes go, yeah, you're right, this does suck, let's get rid of the ones. They form a military, the twos are in charge, and the threes are the ones who fight and die. And at the end of the day, nothing in the triangle has changed except that the ones are gone. When the dust settles, the threes, or the vast majority of the population, don't actually experience a lot of real immediate change. But the twos are happy because now they're at the top. Let's take the American Revolution, for example. The founding fathers were twos. The only people above them were the British, And they had been left alone and allowed to sort of govern themselves, be pretend ones for a little while, until the British come back and try to reassert control and start taxing everyone. And that makes the founding fathers mad. So they rebel, and they get the rest of the colonists fired up, and they join the cause. But when the dust settles and the Constitution is eventually written, most people's lives haven't changed. Slaves are still slaves. Poor white people are still poor white people. Women are women. The only people who can vote are white, property-owning men. The only difference is that the founding fathers are now on top, So in this way, our revolution really wasn't that revolutionary. Also, did you know that the American Revolution was actually a global conflict? For one, we got a ton of support from the French government, who were eager to see the British, their enemy ever since the Hundred Years' War, lose their most valuable colonies. But also, there were a ton of powers in Europe and the Middle East who were really excited about the American Revolution. To them, it was hilarious that the tiny little 13 colonies thought they could overthrow the British, and they thought for sure that if we were to somehow win, we wouldn't be able to survive on our own for long, and maybe one of them could scoop us up for themselves. So these other countries did everything they could to help us beat the British. 
Empress Catherine the Great of Russia, she's my favorite, and we'll talk about her a lot in a few episodes, she led a thing called the League of Armed Neutrality. Basically, the idea was for all of the quote-unquote neutral powers to protect each other's ships from being seized by the British and searched for weapons that they might be sending to the American revolutionaries or other enemies of the British. There were a lot of other wars going on in Europe at this time, too. Basically, this league challenged the British dominance of the seas and made it slightly harder for them to police countries like the French who were sending help to the Americans. And British ships were harassed all around the globe. Even though it didn't accomplish much, the British Navy was so powerful. It is representative of the way a lot of the world was watching the revolution and our shot heard round the world. They wanted to do what they could to weaken the British Empire so that maybe one of them could rise to dominance. Basically, while we were focused entirely on fighting the British, the British were fighting much bigger powers all around the world. In the end, we didn't really win the revolution. Britain just got tired, decided to cut their losses and go home. Yay, America! But the way that our revolution was revolutionary was in what it represented. This was the first time that a colony successfully rebelled against its mother country in modern times. And we didn't beat just any mother country. We beat the freaking British. Nicely done. Also, we did not replace a king with another monarch. So let's go back to that anatomy of a revolution. We grew frustrated with the old regime, rebelled, and established a new government. There were disagreements about what that new government should look like. Should the power go to the states or the federal government? What should we do about slaves? Eh, we'll figure that one out later. And it was totally possible that we could have seen the rise of a strong man who takes over in place of a king. But instead, we got George Washington. Y'all, I love George Washington so much. I don't think people realize how grateful we should be that he was our first president. Think about it. He stepped into a new, completely undefined position. No one had ever been a president before, ever, in the entire world. This position had previously been occupied by a king with absolute power. There were no term limits, and a lot of people in the country called for him to rule indefinitely. Some even wanted to give him a crown. But George, more on a first-name basis, he didn't want that power. He recognized, as a product of the Enlightenment, how important it was to set a precedent that no single person should hold too much power for too long. So he steps down after two terms in office and retires to Mount Vernon, and by doing that, he allows the United States to avoid the chaos and or the slide into dictatorship that almost every other post-revolutionary country will experience. <sighs> For an idea of what might have been our fate if it weren't for George, let's head to France. Act 2 Red, the color of angry men. We can get a better idea of what might have happened in the United States by looking at France. The French government was still basically medieval. Society was divided into three estates. The first two estates were the nobility and the clergy. The both of them made up the ones. But the group we want to focus on is the third estate. This section of society, it was the bottom chunk of the pyramid, and it was made up of everyone else who wasn't a noble or a church official. And it included a growing middle class that was enlightened and making money off trade, and they wanted more power. They're called the bourgeoisie, and there are twos. The rest of the third estate were the peasants, the threes. And here's the key. The third estate made up 98% of the population. They paid all of the taxes, but the way the voting worked in the medieval French parliament, each estate got one vote. So if you've been paying attention, you can see what happens. The two estates of the nobility and the clergy would team up and outvote the third estate, again, 98% of the population, two to one every time. It's pretty messed up. It would be like if each state in the United States only got one vote in Congress. States like Texas and California would be pretty pissed, and I'm sure Texas would secede and elect Chuck Norris as our president. Talk about the rise of a strong man, am I right? Okay, back to France. Just like most revolutions, the Third Estate grew frustrated with the old regime. France was in debt, partly because they helped us win our revolution. Oops, sorry. The peasants were starving, and there were some pretty clueless monarchs in charge. Marie Antoinette never actually said, let them eat cake, but she might as well have. It still gives us a pretty accurate idea of how out of touch they were with the plight of the people of France. There were various spontaneous violent outbursts, 
Some people stormed the Bastille to get weapons and to free political prisoners. But my favorite event is the Women's March on Versailles. On October 5th, 1789, 7,000 women marched from Paris to Versailles, where the monarchs lived. But these women weren't wearing pink knitted hats. They were armed with pitchforks, pikes, and muskets. They wanted to bring the monarchs back to Paris so that they could see how bad things were and have to answer to the growing group of revolutionaries making demands. They stormed the palace at Versailles, and Marie Antoinette only escaped through a secret passageway to a secure apartment. The women wouldn't leave, and they demanded that Marie Antoinette come out to deal with them. When she finally emerged, she saw the heads of her bodyguards on pikes and thousands of muskets pointed at her head. Using her children as a human shield, you know, like you do, she confronted the crowd. Surprisingly, they didn't kill her, but they used the queen as collateral for their demands. The king was forced to sign the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, It's basically copied after our Declaration of Independence. And they moved to Paris, where they were basically prisoners, but still monarchs, ruling alongside the new National Assembly. So they created a constitutional monarchy similar to the one in England. This new moderate government shared power with the king, and this made a lot of the peasants angry. They felt like not enough had changed, and a group of radicals named the Jacobin and led by Maximilian Robespierre ultimately overthrew the National Assembly and instituted the Reign of Terror. This is what we all think about when we picture the French Revolution, but it was really just one phase of a much longer process. You know the drill. Anyone who was an enemy of the revolution, maybe they sympathized with the monarch, maybe they were a moderate, maybe they just made the wrong enemy. They were guillotined. About 40,000 people were executed or murdered in this revolution-turned mob. And you know who else was often executed? Women, who dared to assert that women should be included in the new revolutionary ideas of equality and liberty. Olympe de Gouges, she's the author of the Declaration of the Rights of Women and the Female Citizen. She was convicted of treason and guillotined. Isn't that messed up? Side note, these revolutions and the implementation of Enlightenment ideas about equality and freedom are going to spark the modern women's rights movement. In these new democracies that get formed throughout the 1800s, women will use their roles as mothers to argue that they need more education themselves to teach their children to be good citizens. Eventually, they'll use this new education to push for the ability to go out and serve their community and nonprofit organizations, and eventually the right to vote so that they can ag- advocate for their children and families, of course. This slow expansion of the women's sphere of influence away from the home is happening in most of these early democracies. Also, this sparks the modern abolition movement. It becomes pretty difficult for a lot of these new nations who are arguing for equality and democracy to continue to support slavery. Obviously, the United States is one of the last to give it up, and you could argue that our civil war was just the radical part of our revolution where we disagreed about our government, just about 100 years later. Back to France, King Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette both lost their heads, sparking foreign powers to freak out and declare war on France. Austria was especially upset because Marie Antoinette's mom was the Holy Roman Empress, Maria Theresa. Absolute monarchs were all terrified that they could be the next on the chopping block, literally. So there's chaos within France and war coming from the outside, and out of this chaos rises a man from the military. He helps end the reign of terror and establish stability, but in exchange for a lot of power, and his name is Napoleon Bonaparte. So Napoleon is what George Washington could have been, if George had been even mildly interested in having political power. Napoleon rises out of the chaos and eventually gets named Emperor of France, echoing one of his idols, Julius Caesar. He does a lot of great things for France. He simplified the outdated Roman laws that were inherited from Justinian's code, and he based French law off of reason and the idea that all men have equal rights. He changed the tax system so that it applied to everyone equally, getting rid of the three estates, and he made the government more efficient by centralizing power under himself. How convenient. He also made education more available to middle-class boys, recognizing that he needed educated government officials and members of the military. But Napoleon was not content to stay within the borders of France. He used the war from other absolute monarchies like Austria as justification to try to conquer all of Europe. He wanted to follow in the footsteps of Alexander, Caesar, and Charlemagne and create massive empires. And he does pretty well until he tries to invade Russia in the winter. But Napoleon does successfully conquer the Iberian Peninsula, putting his brother on the throne of Spain. And this has massive repercussions for Latin America. He also sweeps through Austria and Prussia, effectively breaking up the remnants of Charlemagne's Holy Roman Empire, 
and he's eventually captured by the Allies and exiled to the island of Elba off the coast of Tuscany. To be clear, this exile was not a prison. Napoleon got to choose the island he was sent to, and then he was given complete control over Elba and its 12,000 residents. He held court, it was financed by the locals, and he got visits from his mistress. His wife refused to come. I wonder why. Napoleon was allowed to communicate with people in France, and he spent his time building up a small navy and a 600-man imperial guard. Like, was no one watching him? Meanwhile, back in France, the Allies had reinstated King Louis XVII, the son of the guy whose head they chopped off, but there were still revolutionaries who supported Napoleon. When his English overseers left the island to report back to London, Napoleon painted his ship to look like an English vessel, and he left. He returned back to France to take up the fight, and he did until he was finally defeated at Waterloo and exiled to the even more remote St. Helena, and he died there at the age of 51. It's going to take a few more revolutions. I think of them as like aftershocks after the major earthquake of the Reign of Terror. It's going to take a few more revolutions before France entirely becomes a democracy and gets rid of the king. So if you've ever seen Les Miserables, Les Mis actually isn't set during the French Revolution. It's set during one of the later revolutions that kind of happens after the fact. Anyway. But this is what could have happened to the United States. And this is what happens to most other revolutions. Just like conquering an empire, the rebelling is the easy part. It's a lot harder to build a new government that will sustain itself. And that's what the American founding fathers did. I mean, I can definitely be cynical when it comes to a lot of parts of U.S. history, but this is one that I am totally unsarcastic about. We should be really grateful that the first few guys who formed and led our government were rational, enlightened people who wanted to build a country instead of gaining glory for themselves. Thanks, George. After Napoleon's last exile, the nations of Europe sat down in Vienna to figure out how to avoid one power rising up and taking over the rest of the continent again. They brokered a deal that established a pretty important precedent called balance of power. Basically, the main powers in Europe, Britain, France, Austria, Russia, and Prussia, basically Germany 1.0, they established firm national boundaries that would balance each of the main nation's size and power so that no one could ever, in theory, take too much or grow too powerful on the European continent. By 1815, they were realizing that they had bigger fish to fry. Europe was out conquering the world and didn't want to be distracted by border disputes at home. They gave land to some smaller countries to create buffers, like Switzerland, for example. And they also created a new German confederation out of the ashes of the northern part of the Holy Roman Empire. Ironically, this new German state, which was created to provide stability in northeastern Europe between powers like France and Russia, they're the ones that are going to actually shatter this balance of power in about 100 years. But we'll get there. Act 3. The Latin American Revolutions Napoleon Bonaparte has a similar impact on the Atlantic world that the Mongols had on Eurasia. Basically, he shakes things up, wipes the slate clean, and opens the door for a new age. When Napoleon conquered Spain and Portugal, he set off a chain of events that will lead to those countries losing almost all of their colonies. Across Spanish America, when the Spanish king was thrown in prison and Napoleon put his brother on the throne, the colonists rebelled and instated colonial governments that said they were ruling on behalf of the true king who was in prison. And this is nice and all, but a lot of people in these colonial governments quickly realized that they didn't really need Spain at all. Ruling themselves was kind of nice. So even when Napoleon was defeated and the Spanish king returns, they're like, uh, yeah, we're good. These revolutions don't turn out to be very revolutionary, kind of like in the United States, because they mostly end up being led by Creoles. So if you remember from the last era, the Latin American colonies developed a racialized caste system. The people at the very top are peninsulares, people born on the Iberian Peninsula in Spain or Portugal. They're the ones. Below them are the Creoles, people who are 100% European, but born in the New World. And even though they are completely European, the fact that they weren't born in Spain gives them less rights and power than the peninsulares. And they're the twos, and they're pissed about it. So the Creoles turn to the threes all the other castes, the mestizos, mulattoes, the natives, the Africans, and they rile them up to rebel. In South America, this is led by two Creole military officers, Juan de San Martin in the south, modern-day Argentina, Chile, and Peru, and Simón Bolívar in the north, modern-day Venezuela, Colombia, Ecuador, and Bolivia, named after him. They successfully fight off the Spanish, who are busy rebuilding after Napoleon destroyed everything, and they establish new modern republics with themselves on top. 
They had a vision of a united South America. Simón Bolívar dreamed of a Gran Colombia, but regional differences and infighting leads them to break up into different countries. In Mexico, things started out pretty revolutionary. A priest named Father Miguel Hidalgo led a revolution from the bottom, the threes. His followers were peasants and natives. He famously issued his Grito de Dolores, or the Cry of Dolores, which is a town in Guanajuato, Mexico. Father Hidalgo and other priests after he died led guerrilla-style war against the Creoles, Peninsulares, and the Spanish. But things back at home in Spain complicated the issue. When the Spanish monarchy returned to power after Napoleon, they implemented a new, really liberal constitution in an attempt to make their colonies happy and make them want to stay with Spain. It allowed for universal male suffrage and land reform, among other things. In Mexico, the Creoles looked at that constitution and realized that they were about to lose a lot of their power and privilege. So they switched sides. Through the Plan de Iguala, the Creole military officers united with the native insurgents, and from that point, they took control of the revolution. Basically, they realized that it would be better to be on the winning side and get to establish their own new government where they kept their power than risk staying with Spain and possibly losing their privilege through this new constitution. So shady. When they won, they established a short-lived Mexican empire under a monarch, but they eventually set up a republic in 1823. But the point is that the revolutions in Latin America were less than satisfying, especially to the lower castes. They are going to constantly be pulling back and forth between relatively autocratic governments led by the former Creoles and the military, and more democratic, populist governments that try to represent the peasants. In Mexico, they're going to fight another revolution 100 years after this one. In 1910, in an attempt to finish this first revolution and truly give representation to the peasants, various groups will overthrow the republic and set up a new one that is still in Mexico today. Side note, Cinco de Mayo. Let's talk about it. Cinco de Mayo has nothing to do with the Mexican War for Independence. Mexican Independence Day is September 16th, the day of Father Hidalgo's Grito de Dolores. Cinco de Mayo celebrates a day later in the 1800s when Napoleon's nephew and president of France, Napoleon III, tried to conquer Mexico. I guess it runs in the family. The Mexicans defeated the French on May 5th. Today we just drink margaritas and culturally appropriate sombreros, but I thought you might want to know. Now, for a revolution that is entirely revolutionary, Haiti. Haiti was a French colony, and so during the chaos of the French Revolution and the rise of Napoleon, slave owners on the island start taking power for themselves. But there's a disagreement between the different types of slave owners. There's a disagreement between the white plantation owners and the mixed-race small farmers who also own slaves and want to be involved in the new government. While the slave owners are distracted and fighting, the slaves look around and are like, uh, should we do something about this? Enter Toussaint Louverture. He was a former slave who was given a basic education by his former master and eventually allowed to buy his freedom. He did not start the revolution, but he saw the chaos and disorganization of the slave revolts and stepped in, but not before he helped his former master escape the island. He trained the slaves in guerrilla warfare tactics and orchestrated an alliance with the Spanish, who were also at war with France, and they controlled the other side of the island, now known as the Dominican Republic. Toussaint Louverture used the Spanish allies to fight the French, and he eventually used his success as leverage to switch over and deal with the French. He was smart. He negotiated with the French, arguing that he and his former slaves would rather stay with France since they had just abolished slavery during the revolution. The French agreed and named Louverture lieutenant governor of Haiti. Still a colony of France, Louverture allowed some of the planters to return and had the former slaves return to work, although now they were free and paid. But, Defying orders from Napoleon, never a good idea, he invaded the Spanish side of the island, defeated the Spanish, and freed their slaves too. He established himself as governor of the entire island for life, which sort of pissed off Napoleon. Napoleon had kind of cornered the market on the whole leader for life thing, and he didn't really like to be upstaged. But also, by freeing all of the slaves, Louverture had made it hard for France to keep profiting off the sugar plantations. You see, they were fine with abolishing slavery in France, but not in their colonies where they made all their money. You get it. Louverture was eventually taken prisoner by the French and killed under interrogation. Ultimately, the revolution picked up again and the island successfully fought for full independence from France, making Haiti the first former colony to be governed by black people. Further south in Brazil, the Portuguese saw this and thought, oh crap, we have way more slaves than Haiti. 
So they just negotiated with the Creoles to create a constitutional monarchy with their son, Pedro I, on the throne. They shared power with the plantation owners. Brazil will also be the last country to formally abolish slavery in 1888. So Spain and Portugal lose basically all of their colonies right around the time other European countries are going to be putting their colonies to use, fueling a new revolution. But this revolution won't be political. It'll be industrial. Act 4, The Industrial Revolution. Last era, we talked about all of the advances that Europe was making. They were challenging the authority of the church, developing ideas to challenge the monarch, and branching out into the secular and natural world in the fields of art and science. The early discoveries of the scientific revolution laid the groundwork for full-scale industrialization. And the best example where we can see this is the scientific method. The scientific method is that thing we all learned about in our science classes before we did a lab. Our teachers all had flowchart posters of it, and we just took it for granted. But let me remind you of what it is so that then we can talk about what a big deal it is. Basically, it goes like this. You come up with a question you want to answer. After some research, you make a hypothesis, an educated guess of what you think will happen. Then you do tests and experiments and record and analyze the data that you get from those experiments. If your hypothesis turns out to be true, you report it. If it's false, you go back, think about it in a new way, and try something else. This process was created in the early 1600s by a guy named Francis Bacon. Mmm, Bacon. Before the scientific method was created, if you had a question, where did you go? The church. They looked in the Bible and told you the answer. You shrugged and went, ah, okay, and then went home and never thought about it again. If you did think about it again, and maybe had some follow-up questions, the church would be upset with you for doubting the word of God, so you would go home and never think about it again. So the scientists of the early modern era who developed this were freaking revolutionaries. They are putting in place a process that by its definition asks you to question everything and only accept an answer based on observable, quantifiable fact that you see for yourself. Whoa. Now add that on to the fact that in places like England, they have a constitutional monarchy that acknowledges basic rights of citizens that are protected. And the fact that England is competing for dominance with the other kingdoms on the continent They want to race to get the best colonies, and then race to get out all the crops and other natural resources that they can, and so on and so on. This sets up Europe, and England specifically, to lead the way to industrialization. And England had a few other cards up its sleeve, including a growing middle class that had wealth in money, not land, so they could invest in new inventions. They had an urban labor supply because the enclosure movement was pushing small farmers off common grazing areas and forcing them to sell their land to large landowners and move to the cities looking for work. They also had easy access to water transportation and water power, and they had a lot of coal. Like, a lot. You've seen Billy Elliot. That kid is literally dancing through coal fields. So what is the Industrial Revolution? Basically, it just means that people found ways to get machines to do the work that used to be manual labor, and it made everything way more productive. So economies are going to grow super fast, and technology is going to advance with it. The only other two moments in all of human history that are comparable to the Industrial Revolution are the Neolithic Revolution, when people discovered farming, and that time Al Gore created the internet. We don't need to get into it, but a few key innovations are the steam engine, the cotton gin which, contrary to popular belief, actually leads to an increased need for slaves, because now they can process cotton so fast that they need more people to pick it in the fields. And also the telegraph. But there are two biggies that lay the groundwork for most other innovation. The first is interchangeable parts. It's exactly what it sounds like. You manufacture different parts of a thing so that you can interchange them if you need to. So before this innovation, if I have a gun and my trigger breaks, the entire gun is broken because it was all made by hand and it's unique. But now, if my trigger breaks, I can just go to the trigger store and get a new trigger and replace that one part. And for those wondering, the trigger is literally the only part of a gun I can name. Ask me to name another one, I dare you. So now with interchangeable parts, technology and machines can develop more quickly and things can be made more efficiently. The second big idea is the factory system. In the early modern era, some people had come up with an idea hilariously called the putting out system. I always want to make a joke about it in class, but then I remember that I'm supposed to be the adult in the room. The putting out system basically went like this. Let's say I'm a shoemaker, which is the only dumb example my brain can ever come up with. 
During the medieval era, I would make every part of the shoe by hand, myself, in my workshop. I always picture myself like a Keebler elf, but I call it a cobbler elf, and I laugh. Anyway, during the early modern era, I might look around and realize that there are a lot of people, especially women and children, just sitting around their houses with nothing to do, I assume, because in this instance, I'm a man. So I take them some materials, and I ask them to make some parts of the shoe for me. I come back later, pick them up, and pay them for their labor. That's great, but it's pretty inefficient. So now, in the modern era, people come up with the idea of a factory, a building where the workers come to you instead of you bringing the work to them. This is one of those things that our 21st century brains can't fully conceptualize that it wasn't just always a thing. But someone had to invent a factory. They also had to invent a weekend. Think about it. The weekend is just a societal construct. Used to, people just worked when they needed to and then didn't when they didn't need to. But during the Industrial Revolution, they start to create this rigid concept of time that we still live by today. So you work from Monday, from Monday through Friday, and then you rest on Saturday and Sunday, or back then, normally just Sunday. They also created street lamps, and then eventually electricity, because they found that no one was used to working after sundown. So they created something that would make it daytime for longer, so they could get people to work longer. And one of the reasons why the British were so obsessed with tea from India and China, and thus also sugar from the colonies in the Americas, because tea was given to their factory workers to keep them awake for longer during long shifts. It's all coming together now, right? The Industrial Revolution spreads from England to the U.S., Germany, and Belgium first. And then eventually it spreads across Europe. So what were the major impacts of the Industrial Revolution? In Europe, it's massive urbanization. People leave farms and move to the cities for work. They get set up in tenements, really terrible apartment buildings where poor people would be crammed into tiny rooms. The air became polluted because of all the coal. Basically, just picture a Charles Dickens novel. Do you see a tiny boy with knee-high socks and a cap saying something in a Cockney accent? Yeah, good, you get it. But also, we see the rise of a new elite that's going to change the entire concept of wealth. These are people who are rich and influential, but don't own land. They weird out the nobility and the aristocracy who look down on them as new money. This is hilarious to me. Like, if you read Jane Austen books, parents are scandalized when their daughter wants to date a lawyer. How shameful. And he only owns a townhome in London? Scoff. People who didn't make their money in traditional ways and who didn't own vast estates were looked down on by high society. Something that's really similar to Confucian China, who viewed merchants as the lowest of the low. And an interesting thing happens with women. Lower class women get more freedom, but it's just because they have to go work in factories. It's like, you're sort of equal, but you're just equally miserable. But a lot of young women do move to the cities, and they live away from their families for the first time in boarding homes for other single women under the care of an older house mom type. Also, Really wealthy women get some more freedom, as long as they use it to stay within their sphere of influence. Basically, women whose husbands have now made a ton of money start to get involved in charity work, helping the poor or caring for that tiny orphan we all imagined when I mentioned Charles Dickens. This is one of the ways women are going to slowly increase their power. I mentioned it before, but let's talk about it a little more. They start within their sphere of influence, the home. If you remember, after the political revolutions, mothers argued that they needed to be educated to raise good citizens in our new democracy. Well, now, women start to create organizations to care for other women, children, and the sick. All women stuff. But by doing that, they carve out a space where they can learn things like management, budgeting, community outreach, marketing, and advocacy. All skills they are going to turn around and use to push for their own rights, like suffrage. Get it, girls. But weirdly, middle-class women get stuck in this time warp called the cult of domesticity. They're married, and their husbands make enough money so they don't have to work, but they don't have expendable income to be starting charities. So they get put up on a pedestal and idolized by society as wives and mothers without room to do much else. And to be clear, don't get me wrong, there is absolutely nothing wrong with being a wife and a mother. I am both. But I have an issue when women don't have the option to do something else. The last major impact of the Industrial Revolution is that we get the rise of dueling reactions to this new industrialization. On the one hand, a lot of people are really happy about it. They agree with a guy named Adam Smith, who in 1776 wrote a book called The Wealth of Nations that basically outlined what we know as capitalism today. 
This was another example of Europeans challenging traditional authority, in this case, mercantilism. So instead of the mother country deciding everything about the economy and doing what's best for the government, we should just let the invisible hand of the market figure it out. If people need more shoes, someone will step in to make more shoes. If people are willing to pay $1,000 for an iPhone that's basically the same as the one they already have but with less functional headphones, then I guess that's how much a new iPhone is worth. Ugh, bitter. And the people who are happy about this industrialization are the people who are doing well under the new system. Business owners, investors, some of the workers who have independent jobs for the first time. But some people are not happy about this. These are the people who miss the traditional way of doing things, the economy being a more communal effort. Not that there wasn't competition before, but not ever on the scale that we see now, and the gap between the winners and losers and the rich and poor is growing wider every day. Some philosophers start to look around, and they see this gap widening, and they make a prediction. At some point, the people at the bottom have to realize that there are more of them than there are factory owners, and one day, those industrial workers will rise up and overthrow this unfair system and take control of the means of production for themselves. But it's fine. It's fine. I'm sure no one was paying attention to some random German guy with an incredible beard. Like, who's Karl Marx anyway? So, Europe is revolutionizing everything. They are taking all of the cool new ideas that were proposed in the early modern era and using them to smash the traditional ways of doing things in the modern era. Colonists overthrow their mother countries, citizens behead their monarchs, businessmen strike out on their own and make money independent of the church or the crown. And next time, we're going to stay in the same time period, and we'll see how Europe also used all of these tools at its disposal, technological advancement, highly organized government, and a real big superiority complex to subjugate the rest of the world and create empires on which the sun never set. To be continued. For notes, a full transcript of tonight's episode, links to sources, and other fun stuff, check out the podcast appendix page at www.antisocialstudies.org. Join me next time on Antisocial Studies as we explore the age of imperialism, or as I like to call it, allow me to ruin the jungle book for you. And don't forget that if you like what I'm doing, please subscribe to my podcast so you'll know when the next episodes are up. And if you really like what I'm doing, then go to iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts and give me a review. Thanks. Thanks.